Today on The State of Us, natural gas shortages sets off a scramble ahead of winter. What about making your kitchen more efficient? We've got a realistic guide to reducing food waste. Welcome to The State of Us. I'm your host, Justin T. Weller. Joined today, of course, by the one and only friendly redneck liberal, Mr. Lance L. Jackson, also senior historian here, senior resident historian here at True Chat, pardon me, and uh, also the famous one for the word of the day. But today we're looking at a host of different things. You heard a little bit about them. Uh, numerous natural gas tankers are being diverted and manufacturers are slowing production as countries and businesses are battling to secure supply ahead of winter. The transition to cleaner energy sources isn't far enough along to meet a surge in demand. And with very little gadgetry and a little bit of strategy, you can cook, serve, and store food far more wisely and sustainably. Here's how one working mother pulls it off in her busy household. All of that and more today we'll be getting to, but of course we couldn't begin without the word of the day. Well, I just want to make sure I'm not, I have a, my own residence. I'm not a resident of True Chat. Oh. The way, yeah. you, the way you said that, I didn't want people to think that you just pull me out of the closet and well, do well, shows and here, I, I, I live here at True Chat. Oh, well, you, I mean, you could. Yeah, There's I, a shower or I know, a bathroom. I, I know, I could. I've thought about okay. it. There, there have been times at home. <laughs> Well, I'm glad I've got a key. <laughs> Just in case you can come in yep. and sprawl out in the studio. And- well, I'm a fanatic and an enthusiast about today's show, so I am an inner gumen. E-N-E-R-G-U-M-E-N. Inner gumen. I'm a fanatic and an Spell enthusiast. Spell that one more time. Four syllables. E-N-E-R-G-U-M-E-N. Energumen. 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 <laughs> okay. I'm an enthusiast about energy. Well, and Lance, before we totally shift to this, I think we want to give a shout out, right? We got a nice uh, comment from a listener. So uh, what was that gentleman's name? Appreciate that Mr. Nick Brown took the time to write on, on about the possible civil war breaking out again in the United States and uh, had a lot of interesting points that he wanted to make and share with us. And we could tell by what he wrote that um, he had listened to the entire show. And we always appreciate that. And we appreciate his input and his thoughts on what we had to say and what he thinks um, could happen and possible ideas for a future show because he was sharing, you know, there, you could have talked about this, this, and this. And um, we feel your pain. We feel the same way. We have to, you know, we're trying to get it down into that 38 minutes and 30 seconds, uh, there are things that we'd like to say that just don't make the break, but I appreciated him pointing those out. Yes. A perfect example of, of what, when we say we'd like you to send in uh, your thoughts, right? That's what we're talking about. That's exactly what we'd like to see. So if you'd like to follow the great example of Nick and send something in, you can do so by emailing podcast at the state of us.org. Natural gas stocks are alarmingly low around the world for natural gas energumens, and prices in most places have never been higher after surging to new records in Europe and Asia this week, according to a Wall Street Journal article. Demand has jumped as economies have bounced back from the pandemic shutdowns, and the squeeze has caught traders, ship owners, and energy executives off guard. Even in the United States, the world's largest producer of natural gas, the bidding war has dragged up prices to their highest in over a decade, setting the stage for an expensive winter season and higher electricity bills. So if you're somebody out there, Lance, who relies on natural gas, be on the lookout, right? You've been warned. It's coming. The price hikes for years, those the, that, that great HVAC salesman that came to your home and sold you, oh, it'll be great. You know, nothing better than natural gas. You'll love it. It's going to be perfect. It'll be cheap forever. Well, maybe not forever uh, because there's a number of things that go into this shortage, right? I mean, I just highlighted a few of them, but you read this article and it's like this after this, after this, after this. Well, 
And that doesn't mean it's not going to be because there's all, there are also, as you get to the end of the article, things that they say will probably ease off, but it's like anything else in a capitalist economy where we're buying products, buying commodities here, that there, there is a crunch and there's a crunch because one of your favorite things and mine as well is to try to stop global warming and take care of things. And so more and more countries and more companies have started to shut down their coal powered plants to stop carbon emissions and they went to natural gas. So there's more pressure on the natural gas market because companies are doing away with coal. And, and one of the byproducts of this higher price nat natural gas is that we've seen countries and companies start to open up their coal producing plants again because natural gas is not cheap. So there's there are that, those byproducts as well, where not only is the price going up for those of us who heat with it, but for companies that use it to run their manufacturing plants, um, they're now saying, well, you know what? It's so expensive to make products, which means now oh, inflation, right? You're going to see a rise in other things. Well, to, to stop that, they're saying, well, you know, we're going to have to fire back up our, our coal plants. And so the yin and yang, right, of, of the whole situation. Yeah, well, one of the items the article mentions is that transformed energy market, right? And you've got increasing energy prices, and that's threatening to goose inflation, which then snarls industry activity and slows the revival in the world economy post COVID-19. So there's a lot of different components going into it. Another one they mentioned that I thought was uh, critical to talk about is the worker shortage, because even if you say, OK, well, you know, we have a shortage of natural gas or we need more, um, then what do we do? Well, we up production. Well, you're going to need people for that. Right. And we already know, uh, as we've covered recently on this program and continue to cover, there is a labor shortage right now. Um, and I think this is an additionally difficult field to get people to work in um, for any number of reasons. Obviously, better information in recent years uh, lets us know about health risks to working around facilities like this, uh, but not just health risks. There's also the negative stigma attached to working in this industry, right? We covered that issue um, when we were talking about uh, young workers and the labor shortage as it pertains to energy companies. I think that was like six or eight months ago where they were having a really hard time. Uh, keeping young professionals and hiring young professionals to do uh, not just the physical labor component, but even the white collar component of their what they were just there was a lot of people who didn't want to work in this field, right? We've got to mention, right, Lance, that is natural gas better than coal? Absolutely. You know, is it better than oil? Uh, yes, by most respects, you know. It is, generally speaking, a much better all-around choice. Is it a green energy? No, it is not. It relies on fossil fuels uh, to exist. Now, it's much cleaner burning, which is why it's better, has high energy density, um, and those are all wonderful positives, you know. So, the question is, well, where does this all fit in? You know, but there's there's two parts to this. As you're talking about it, one of the reasons the supply is low, though, too, is because here in the United States where we produce it, we had that really cold February in Texas where the gas wells froze. And this summer, we had the hurricanes that shut down the gas production in the Gulf of Mexico. So climate change is actually hurting fossil fuels. Well, now there's no, some there's some karma. There's, if you've right. Ever heard well, of it. but there's <laughs> see that's the only if we only if we're not going to be transparent, we say see we're telling you we got to change. But the flip side of this is that we need to do something as you were talking about there to bridge the gap because in Europe they're claiming more natural gas because the wind speeds were slower than normal and crimping the amount of power that they got from their green energy sources out in the Atlantic Ocean. And also, climate change again here, right? Hydroelectric power has been damaged in places like Brazil, China, and the United States because 
there's not enough water, there's not enough rain to power the hydroelectric dams that they've been counting on. And so they've been entering into the gas market. So we've got some of these greener energy sources, right, that we've started and they're better, but we need something to bridge the gap because we haven't done enough yet to fully fund the amount of power that is needed to keep prices the same. The other item to mention too, because you left out everything except solar, and you might say, well, it doesn't sound like solar would really be impacted by this, but in an end around way it is, because why? It's manufactured in China. Most of it, not all of it. Most of the solar panels. Most of the solar panels are manufactured in China. And what does China use uh, to power the facilities that makes uh, these solar panels? Coal. Yes. Coal and oil. And so the issue being that it's great to say transition to green energy, but everybody's pleased that cost of solar has been coming down. Uh, well, part of the reason for that is cheap energy used to make the panels, which happens to not be green energy. So, um, you know, if you if the price of coal and uh, oil go up, right, then so too will the cost of producing said solar panels. Now, you might say, well, wait, if if my solar panels are produced using coal and oil, uh, then th is it even worth getting solar panels? And just so that everybody knows, the answer to that question is yes, you're welcome to look it up. Now, would it be better if we produced them using energy from green sources? Absolutely, from a climate standpoint. But it is still worth it. It just takes longer to offset because of the initial, you know, solar panels you're probably going to get most of them are warrantied for 25 years, you're probably going to get a useful life of 40 years or more out of them. Um, and generally, depending on the estimates you look at, that carbon offset is going to take place somewhere around five or six years. So absolutely still worth it. You know, it, it, it's not to say that, oh, well, don't go solar, but it is to say that fossil fuels still are tied to and have an impact on um, are renewables. There's a lot that goes into uh, the the market issue, but what else needs to be done to get renewables ready to take over? And how has California served as an example? All of that and more to come. Keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. Energy energumens everywhere will be thrilled that California is paving the way. They might be thrilled unless they live in California. And then if they did, they would know that uh, it's been a little rocky, right? It's not just been uh, a smooth sailing. Uh, because if you don't know, in California, there's actually a law uh, that requires that the state achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And they've been moving aggressively ahead, and that's public and private, okay? So that's not just the state government that we're talking about. They're requiring that all companies arrive at that same uh, standard. So people are rushing to make changes. Uh, they're planning to take off offline, you know, the remainder um, of their fossil fuel facilities and their last um, nuclear power plant, which provides, by the way, about 10% of all power for the state. Um, that's a different conversation. We've talked about that before, whether or not uh, nuclear should really be abandoned um, or whether or not it should be part of that transitional phase like um, natural gas is. But point is, we all have heard about the power problems and the power companies saying, you know, we need you to conserve and and all of these many issues. And in fact, they've installed backup generators at some of their facilities that burn uh, oil or natural gas. Uh, as a way to prepare for some of those further issues. So California is trying, Lance, but in some ways uh, it's not going exactly the way they'd like it to. Well, I think we have to prepare, right, if we're going to make it through and do some of the things that we need to do for the climate. There are things in California where, uh, you know, I have relatives who live, they have rolling blackouts because of the power source, you know, and they have to... Uh, they have – not only do they have b rolling blackouts, but they have price changes during the day 
so that if you want to use energy when everybody else is using energy, it's more expensive on your bill. Um, and so, you know, you have those things that most of us here in the Midwest don't know anything about. You know, we we have blackouts when the power lines go down because of wind or snow or ice or something like that, uh, but not when everything's working and the power company just says, yeah, we're cutting off your power for the next three hours because the generators are, are maxing out and, and we can't do that. So, and one of the things that makes this very important is the investment, right? Whether it's private or government, there needs to be more investment in clean energy. And the article that we've connected at, at the State of Us points out that right now there's about $1.1 trillion around the world invested in clean energy sources. But in order to make this work, that needs to go up to $3.4 trillion a year until 2030. So Yes, we are doing things, as you point out, we are trying to improve it in different parts of the United States and the world, but this is going to take even more investments because you can't just flip the switch and say, okay, I'm getting rid of carbon and I'm going to go to clean. You know, we're, we're going to all have to ride the wave here, but the other side, right, the grass is a lot greener, as they say. If we all do this and we live through this, and make the changes, no matter how incremental it is, we can provide a better future for those generations that follow us. And I think that's what motivates me the most is that I'm enthusiastic, right, um, about young people. And I want to leave the world a better place than I found it. And so that's been my goal. And I think the more we get people on that bandwagon and we understand that it's not going to be a straight line and it's not going to be an easy trip to take, but we can do this and everything we do, no matter how small or how large it is, whether you're reusing things at home or you're putting up panels on your house to get your energy, it all helps, you know, or, or you go out and you buy an electric car. I mean, there are all things we can do more of. But every little bit helps, and we just all have to get on the bandwagon. Well, and we've talked about before, I think once you adjust to a mindset of thinking about it, it's amazing how simple it can be to make adjustments. And a lot of times, we've talked about this too, a lot of times the adjustments are are just better, you know? Uh, they're not always things, I think everybody thinks about, not everybody, but many people think about going green as an inconvenience, right? Now, to Lance's point, is it going to be seamless? No. Is it always going to be easy? No. But is the grass greener, pardon the climate pun, on the other side? Uh, yes. But you know, you know what motivates or at least motivates people like me? And that is the cost savings. When I can save money by being green, it makes me want to be even greener. And I know it doesn't work that way in all the, in, in everywhere in the world, but I think here in the United States, that's a big motivator for people because you mentioned the fact that it's an inconvenience to do it. But when it's shown, when companies or politicians or people like us do doing shows show people that you can save money by doing this, that gets everybody's attention. You know, I, I know that I've, I've I've wavered for the last two years. It's like. I'm not, you know, on, on getting solar panels because I've seen and, and listened to you. Uh, I've seen your bills and, 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 and had you talk to me about how much money you're saving already. You know, I mean, I know there's that initial investment, but it's like, gosh, I, I mean, I just need to pull the trigger. And it's like, it's just so hard to make that investment at something that high. But when you see the cost effectiveness of it over a longer period of time, I think that's what motivates people. And that's the message that needs to be sent out is that when you do this or you buy the electrical car, or you put the, the solar panels on your roof or you recycle or you do this or you do that, the savings that, you, you know, the, the extra money that you get, you know, is, is that big motivating factor, especially here in the United States. Well, and a lot of them are compounding, right? I mean, the, the, um, the dream team is the solar power and electric car, uh, combo because 
you are generating most of the power that your vehicle requires. Um, and that's what I was thinking as you were talking about this. While really a lot of the pain that's felt is secondary to most consumers because the transitional pain, for example, for my household to install solar panels and get an electric vehicle, it really didn't hurt, you know, very much or really at all. I mean, yeah, I had to spend, you know, I think three or four days total coordinating um, the solar stuff, you know, and, and them being there to install. But I'm talking about end to end, you know, time that I spent on the phone with somebody or email and the actual install time was only about three or four total days, you know, so not very much. Um, and now I don't do anything. And even if you don't have solar panels or can't have, I think we've talked before about if it's only going to cost you three to eight dollars to fill, and I'm using air quotes here, your electric vehicle, I don't think anybody needs to be a math expert. I mean, if you pass second grade math, right, you should be able to figure out that 40 or $50 is a lot higher than $8. <laughs> and that if I can fill up for $8, that's a better deal than filling up for 50 I just spent $100 yesterday at the gas station Ooh, to fill up that hurts. two vehicles that will last about 10 days. But when you point out that, oh, you know, you could have done the same thing for 15 to $30, hmm, gets the old boy thinking. So what, what can you do? I mean, we've talked, you know, I feel like endlessly on the show about electric vehicles and solar panels. And I mean, we'll keep talking about them because I like talking about them, but there are other things you can do. Um, and that includes making your kitchen more efficient. And it's like, oh my gosh, this sounds bad. You know, well, I mean, I'll be honest, some of it sounds like things that I'm not going to do. Uh, but some of the other things are just like, well, yeah, if I throw away less food, that again, right? We're talking about that's better for you because, oh, I hate, I don't know if there's anybody out there, but there's not a lot of things I'll use the word hate for in life, but I hate wasting food, especially food that you've spent money on. You know, you bought it, it sits there and you're like, oh, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. And then all of a sudden it's bad. And then it's like, oh my gosh, literally taking money, you know, taking Lance's precious cash and just wadding it up and putting it in the trash can. That's what you're doing, you know? And it's like, ooh, that's a, that's a tough proposition there. So what can we do about that? Well, to find out, keep it here on The State of Us, and we'll be right back. With very little gadgetry and a bit of strategy, you can cook, serve, and store food far more wisely. A working mother who is a bit of an Energumen kitchen uh, expert is looking for ways to reduce her household waste. So she's found some interesting, uh, some interesting options. What, what do we got, Lance? H how are you, the Mr. Lance Jackson, Master Chef Extraordinaire, uh, going to improve uh, kitchen viability? Well, I think there's a couple things I want to point out, and I'll, and I'll answer that real quickly here. But uh, according to this article. A third of all food produced in the United States ends up in the trash. Think about that. <sighs> Horrific. How, how many people could we feed, right? Mm -hmm. Around the world, in the United States. I mean, because obviously, if we don't throw it in the trash, you say, well, we're not going to eat it. I mean, okay, but that's stuff that can be taken, food that can be taken other places. A well, third. And, and, and we're buying, right? Because that also tells us we buy more food than we need because we end up throwing food away that we don't use. So obviously, we don't need everything that we're uh, spending money on. And that's not just consumers, but businesses as well. So first there's that. And then, you know, that food has to decompose, right? Or, or rot. And when it does, it's 86 times more potent with methane and driving up global warming than carbon dioxide. So you're telling me that my food that you don't eat is actually worse that you throw in the trash. Right is worse than me driving my big old maroon pickup truck around. Exactly. Oh, so an, a, a, an even bigger reason 
to hate uh, wasting food. And it's about wasted food accounts for about 8% of all greenhouse gas emissions. 8% from wasted food. Not food, wasted food. So if we just cut out the food waste, we would reduce global emissions by 8%. Now, this article was talking about composting. And we're not going to get into that, but I love the comment that the author made. And that is that, and psychologists have, have named this, call it, they call it a keystone habit. But one simple change that shifts your day-to-day behavior causes a domino effect on other habits. So as I talk now and answer Justin's question, okay, what do I plan to do or what do I do? Understand that you don't have to do all of these things. If you start to do one of them, then that might change something else. And and that's the whole point of of what I think is important about talking about this is we're not expecting you to be a member of the clean plate club, you know, and eat nothing but leftovers until it's all gone and then cook something else because that's going to be hard. But what are some things that we can do, okay, that that help? One of the things that I, I, this is where I fall into a trap, and my daughters do a lot better job. Meal planning before shopping and sticking to your list. <clears throat> because what's the number one food waste thing probably that you do? You impulse buy and you say, you know, this really looks good. I'm going to make this. And then you don't. Or you <clears throat> make too much because you think, oh, I'm really going to like And you get tired of it. Okay. Um, so the f- number one on the list is to shop prudently. Don't buy spontaneous when you go to the market. Um, another one that I like, and this is what I do, okay, is I bend the rules. Quit following the recipes like a gospel. Start fudging on things, okay? If it calls for one diced tomato and you got two and they're both about to go bad, cut them both up and use them, okay? Um, if you're out of sour cream and the and the recipe calls for sour cream, well, don't go buy a big 16-ounce tub or be like me, buy the 32-ounce tub because it's on sale. It's a deal. And then throw (laughs) half of it away. They got you. See, they got you. You got a little bit of yogurt in the refrigerator? Ah. Just put that in instead. You know, learn Mm. to adapt the recipes to what you have in your refrigerator that you can use up. Um, I love that one. Okay. And Last but not least, and I and this is this is so true and it's so hard. How you store things in the refrigerator will decrease the amount you have to throw into the trash. Because things will stay better longer and well, not spoil as And if you put it in an opaque bowl, something you can't see through, and then you cover it. You know, plastic, a saran wrap that you didn't have to throw away and has to decompose. You got a double loser there because you can't see what's in that bowl. And because it's in that bowl, it gets pushed to the back of the refrigerator. And most of us, when we open the refrigerator, we look up front. Uh, yeah, nothing looks good. And, and it's so sitting in the back, we slowly make something rotting. Else. And, and when some, there's something <laughs> that you want in the back, but you can't see it. So you need to label and put things in clear containers. And what she talks about about containers, instead of going out and buying, you know, run to Ikea, I'm going to buy a whole collection of things to store my stuff in. Well, if you buy takeout food, a lot of those plastic containers that you have that they give you the food in are great to store food. We just sent all kinds of Thanksgiving home. And what we use are those plastic containers that we've used. So is it good to buy takeout food in a plastic container? You know, okay, some more licensing here, but at least you can reuse them again by... You can make it less bad. Right. You know, and use it three or four times. I mean, until it starts to fall apart, that's a whole lot better than going out and buying new all the time or buying, wrapping things on a plate with saran wrap and then using the saran wrap and just throwing the saran wrap away and then going buy more saran wrap and then, you know, or more aluminum foil or whatever. So those are the ones that I think is, you know, the really hard one. And I hear this all the time from, from the younger generation that I just cannot do. And that is meal planning. But when I think about it, that's not new. My mom did that. My mom meal planned. I mean, she, she wrote out her grocery list and then I can tell you we had 
meatloaf on Monday and fried chicken on Tuesday and this on, you know, beans on Wednesday and right, right on down the list. And huh, that's what I was loading in the grocery cart when I went with mom to the grocery store. So I think that's the biggest thing. That's the greatest idea. And so you want to get into a couple of the other ones that I'm sure you're not doing. Like, uh, um, I'll bet you're, you're not sure. saving you're your sure. celery ends and your uh, carrot peels, uh, are you? I, well. And freezing them for future use. I, I will say if that. I, I, if I checked your freezer, uh, I, you got a, you got like four bags of carrot peelings in there for your next soup. I, I guess I'm, I guess I'm a weird one this way that I, I don't peel carrots. And as far as the um, kale, uh, or the kale, not the kale. The um, the celery goes. Uh, I I really don't care for celery. Um, I don't know why. I I'm not sure what it is. You know so, what's helped me with this stuff? I like the texture of celery. <laughs> yeah. I do not like the taste of celery. I'm fine. I like the fresh, crunchy. Like that's great. It's I. It's something about the flavor of celery is just not appealing. Now I will eat it. Uh, if it's in like chicken salad or something like that, you know, where it has a... I thought you were going to tell me if it was coated cream. in ranch dressing, then you would well, eat it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as long as I can't taste it, I'll eat it, you know? <laughs> we do buy kale, though, and kale stems are one of those tricky um, those tricky items. So what I do do with food waste, though, we started doing this about a year ago. It's not exactly, you know, traditional composting, well, I mean, maybe it's more traditional than what we do now, but we have a little um, flower bed out back and we just, you know, throw the food waste right out there on top of the soil. And this year, for example, uh, one of the things that came up, I, did, I mean, I didn't plant or sow the seed, was a butternut squash plant. Huh. And we got two uh, butternut squash from it, you know, and we got three pumpkins this year and... Um, and that's one of the point is you yeah. want to you want to stop food waste, grow your own, and w- and there you go. You're well, and this was just composting this was a just little stuff bit stuff that we had, right. you know, but, that but I threw out there, and it, you're fulfilling that point that psychiatrists make that you did one good thing, you threw the waste in the ground, and what happened? Some stuff grew that you weren't planning on that you that could we then use to eat, and we used all of it. I mean, we right. put the pumpkins out for Halloween. Um, we ate. The butternut squash actually still got one of them in the refrigerator. Um, you don't have to put butternut squash in the refrigerator, by the way, for people just curious. I think I think the point of this is every little bit we do makes a difference. And so Snowball. you don't have to do Snowball all effect. of this. That To me, that's the point I want to drive home is because some of these you're going to look at and say, I can't do it or my living arrangements don't allow for it. But I think that's why I started out with the meal, the meal prepping and only going, stopping the impulse buying at the grocery store, at the market, and just getting what you need. I think that's something that we can all apply. This reminded me of a, of a story that I read. I don't know if you read it when you were little, called uh, Rock Soup. This vagrant, I didn't know the word vagrant when I was five and six years old, but this guy that these little kids found was uh, out there and he goes, you guys ever had rock soup? And they go, no, how do you make rock soup? He goes, well, this is my magic rock. And he puts the rock down in the in the pan and starts a fire, you know, some firewood that he has. And then he, he tells them to, um, would well, you have any carrots or vegetables that your parents are going to throw out? Well, yeah, my mom, I've got stuff that mom wants me. He goes, well, bring that. Da, 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 da. And what he does is he takes the leftovers from all these little kids' houses and he throws it into a bowl, goes down to the creek, gets water, and they have rock soup. You know, and it's obviously it's not rock soup, but it's a way to right. get them to do the things that they were. And this was, I think about it, this was really far advanced. This was in the 60s teaching environmentalism. The things that you're going to throw away, the food items you're going to throw away, you go get them, bring them to me. We'll put them in with my magic rock, and then we'll have a meal. And, and I think that's the other thing learn to use things in a variety of ways. Well, and and the message too is that like with the all this kitchen stuff, it's not just good for the environment, right? It's good for your pocketbook. It is good economically. It is silly to waste things that you spend money on, to literally throw them away and to get nothing for them. That's just, you know, not a great way to spend money. I mean, if I asked every listener on the show to take, you know, 
one third of what they spend on food and hand it to us in cash and then light it on fire, most people would have a problem with that. You spend $300 a month on food, you're throwing away $100. $100. Yep. And we'll all feel, uh, you know, just atrocious at that. The the two things uh, that I just mentioned to wrap with as you were talking that I have found the impulse buying thing is tough, you know, because you go to the store, they lay it out to get you to impulse buy, right? That's the whole point. So for me, the online pickup thing has been a big benefit over the past few years of that because yes, they still try to nab you on the app, but I, most of what I do is I go back to previous purchases and add previous purchases to cart and then take out the things I don't need for that purchase. Because let's be honest. I mean, a lot of us probably out there are not, incredibly elaborate chefs, we make a lot of the same stuff again and again at home, right? So the impulse buys are part of what kill you. And if you get down what you actually use and need, it can be a lot. It's very helpful for me anyway, to not go to the store because I will get caught up in the bakery section way too long and buy a bunch of things I don't need, which the things that I buy also generally are not very healthy, right? I mean, that's the other, this other unintended consequences, the bad foods. And the last thing is to your point about the containers, uh, we did invest in and had them for years now. And I'm very glad that we have them glass, um, storage containers. And you might say, well, why is that matter over the plastic? Well, for me, it means using the leftovers more because I don't love the microwave and I will put these glass containers are oven rated. So you take the leftovers in the container they're in. I don't have to dirty anything else right in the oven, you know, warm them up and you can eat them. And that to me, again, that's just a tiny way that I think it makes a difference to using the leftovers because when they're in the plastic, okay, well, I got to get them out of here and put them into something else that I can heat them up in, or I have to put them in the microwave if it's, you know, microwave plastic safe. And those are just not terribly appealing for me with leftovers. So and Justin has his electric range that is powered by his solar panels. <clears throat> and it just makes sense because you got to know people are out there thinking, oh, and they're going to turn on the oven. Now you're going to use right. natural well, yeah, gas. It's an uh, electric no, no. oven. <laughs> it's an electric oven with his solar panels yes. using his free electricity. So there you go. Exactly. Yep. And you could, I suppose you could heat them up on the stovetop too. I haven't thought about that, but just set the bowl, you know, right there. So anyway, those are things, uh, the clear is a big deal as well. Cause you know, being able to see what is in it is helpful. So you know what turns your stomach and wants you to eat. Yep. Right. What you want to eat. So why do we have this conversation? Oh, man. Today, Lance? Well, we did that, did this because we're enthusiasts. I'm not even going to say the word because you won four to two. So I'm not going to try to make a comeback. Here. <laughs> but our mission here is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations. And hopefully you've enjoyed today's show. You share it with folks and they say, well, we'd like to listen to this and not just depend on you to tell us, even though it's great that you're doing that. Uh, where can we find this show? And you can tell them as a podcast. They can find us on Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere podcasts are found. The State of Us is available Tuesdays and Thursdays as a podcast first thing in the morning and heard on the weekends across the country on AM and FM radio. For The State of Us on True Chat in Urbana, Ohio, I'm Justin T. Weller. I'm Lance Jackson. Victorious today, Bradley will note it down. Special thanks to producer Bradley Butch and our audience for witnessing this magnificent victory. We'll see you all next time. Be the change. Be sure to check out our website, thestateofus.org, for books, articles, and all the ways to tune in. Thestateofus.org.